Let us pray together. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do enter into the glory of your ministry of the word this morning. And as we do so, we do pray that you would enlighten our minds to see the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, with greater clarity and understanding. We pray that you would enable us to see him as the vision of our souls all the days of our lives. And we ask our Father and our God that you would draw out our love for him more and more as we hear the sweetness of the gospel of our salvation. Our Father, we are a weak and a needy, even a sinful people. And therefore, the only ground upon which we can stand before you is the ground of pure and free and sovereign, saving grace. Our Father, help us to see that grace and the person who grants it to us. For we ask all of these things in our Savior's holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm 9 verses 7 to 11. It is a celebration of the fact that you and I are not caught in the jaws of fate. We're not being governed by an impersonal force, but we believe that the Lord reigns forever, that the Lord is enthroned in Zion, that he controls every detail of our lives, and therefore we can come before him with the greatest assurance, for as we see in this psalm, he has promised that he will judge the world in righteousness, he will govern the peoples with justice, and because he is a righteous God who offers us his wisdom, we can come before him with the utmost assurance of faith, as we're about to recite here, those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So I'll begin, if you would follow as we celebrate the sovereignty and also the grace of the Lord in our lives. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Sing praises to the Lord, enthroned in Zion. The Lord is promising here that he will judge the world and all the nations of the earth in righteousness. And because he will do that, it is imperative to each one of us that we do trust in his holy name and receive his Son into our lives, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, with this in mind, let's turn over the same sheet as we confess our sins together. We acknowledge our weakness and our propensity to sin and to rebel against the Lord each and every day that we live. And so we are going to be calling upon his name and receiving the grace that he so freely offers to us as his adopted sons and daughters. Let us humble ourselves before the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, many of us come before you today with troubled hearts and minds. We are fearful about our relationships, our health, our finances, our families, our futures, and many other things. We have a hard time believing in you in a way that would bring comfort to our hearts. Instead, we greatly doubt your love and concern for us, and sometimes even your very existence. We are not calmed by the thought that you have prepared a place for us in heaven. Father, forgive our unbelief. Jesus, thank you for your fearless faith. Thank you that for the joy that was set before you, you persevered through far greater pain and suffering than anything we will ever suffer. In fact, through greater pain and suffering than we can even imagine. Thank you that you will come back and take us to be with you forever, wiping away all our tears and comforting lest our grieving and broken hearts. Well, our assurance of pardon this morning is taken from Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, of course, is the liability that we have to the wrath of God because of our sin and rebellion. 
but because we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ as a beautiful robe of salvation, we know no longer does the law of God flash with lightning and peals of thunder against us. And so we are forgiven, and we are loved by God with an everlasting love, and we praise him for that this morning. Well, let's remain seated as we sing El Shaddai, El Shaddai, number 42. Let's sing together. We just sang a bunch of Hebrew together, so it's helpful to remind ourselves what we're singing. El Shaddai means God Almighty. El Elyon means God Most High. Na Adonai means O Lord. And Nurkamka means we will love you. So I pray that that would indeed be the sincere prayer of each one of your hearts as we sing El Shaddai this morning. But at this time, we are going to be praying for God's blessings to descend like the refreshing rain upon his people. And so we had a funeral yesterday. We celebrated the life of our brother Gordon's wife, Jackie. She entered into glory on the 7th of April. And so we rejoiced with our brother Gordon over her life, but also mourned with him over her death. And so we are going to be praying that God's blessings would be upon Gordon in the days to come that he would learn that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And that friend, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who grants us the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to draw near to us all of our days through thick and through thin. We're also going to be praying for the Hastings family. We appreciate the presentation that was given to us during Sunday school as they reach out to Muslim families around the Atlanta area. We're going to be praying that the Lord gives them persevering grace to love those people in very tangible ways and that the Lord would continue to open up two things, not only opportunities to speak the word of God, but also human hearts to receive the love of God that they so freely offer to these people. So let's pray and call upon the name of the living God together. Our Almighty Father, we rejoice this morning that you are El Shaddai, the God who is almighty. 
the God who possesses boundless power and ability to do all of your holy will and to accomplish all of your plans of grace and of salvation on behalf of your needy people. And yet, our Father, as we lift our hearts to the throne of heavenly glory this morning, we rejoice that you are not only El Shaddai, but also that you are El Elyon, God Most High. For our Father, we recognize that there are many claimants to your throne. There are many false and rival gods which would rise up above you and topple you from the throne of your sovereign grace. And yet, our Father, we freely acknowledge this morning with all that is within us that you are not only El Shaddai, but El Elyon, God Almighty, and the God who is most high. Our Father and our God, I do pray that you would lay bare your holy arm in the midst of all the nations of the world, showing them your power and your glory in the face of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father and our God, as we live out our lives in this world that you have established, we recognize that day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where your voice is not heard. In other words, as we walk through the beautiful theater of this world, we see your glory everywhere that we look. And so, our Father, we do thank you for your creative handiwork and glory that we see every day that we live. We hear it in the chirping of little birds. We see it in the majestic, rugged mountains. We also behold it in the beauty of the waves of the ocean. And yet, our Father and our God, we recognize that if we truly want to know who you are in all of your glory and majesty, we have to study the life of your only begotten Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, our Father, we thank you for all 66 books of the Bible which lead us to believe in him, which show us his grace and his glory and how essential it is for us to receive him as our prophet, priest, and king. Our Father and our God, I do pray through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which you have granted unto your people on the day of Pentecost, that all of our sin and chaff would indeed be burned up and consumed. I pray that our hearts would burn brightly with love to the triune God. And help us, Lord, to love one another, even as we drink deeply of the fountain of your grace and love for us. Help us to offer our lives individually, personally, upon the altar of service for one another, so that your kingdom of grace might become clear in the eyes of many people who are broken and bruised because of the ravages of sin in this life. Now, our Father and our God, as we call upon your name, we do pray that your blessings would descend upon the Peterman family. We thank you, Lord, for their presence in the house of God yesterday as we heard the word of life and as we celebrated the life of our sister Jacqueline, who was born in the state of Nebraska, but died in El Cajon, California. Our Father and our God, we thank you for Jackie's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for her love for Psalm 23, and for our ability to say, along with Jackie, who is now in glory, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Our Father and our God, I pray that because of your conquering grace within our souls, that you would grant to each and every one of us the ability to say with the utmost sincerity, the Lord is my shepherd, and that I truly am like a sheep who is so prone to wander astray from the love and care of my perfect shepherd. Our Father and our God, be with our brother Gordon at this time. I pray that you would undergird him with your love. Our Father, you have promised us that even as the mountains surround the city of Jerusalem, so you would surround each one of your people with your unfailing love and faithfulness all the days of their lives. Father, do this for our brother Gordon in the days to come, and I pray that you would help us, even through these reminders of our mortality, that we are all strangers and pilgrims upon the face of the earth, and that we are traveling to an everlasting destiny. Our Father and our God, I pray that there would be a sparkle in our eyes and a joy deep down within our hearts as we think about the fact that we are going home. We're entering into the presence of the triune God, and we will see the glory of the one who loves us with an everlasting love and understand him more fully than we have ever understood him here upon this earth. Our Father and our God, I pray that you would refresh us with the glory of the gospel even this very day. Now, our Father, we have been asked to pray already this morning to the one who is the Lord of the harvest, for the harvest truly is plentiful, but those who labor for the harvest are truly few. 
And so, our Father and our God, I pray that you would raise up many laborers for the harvest who would devote their lives and their service and their gifts which you have granted unto them for the glory of your own name and to win souls for eternal life in Jesus Christ. Our Father and our God, we desperately need a work of your Holy Spirit to descend upon this congregation. We desperately need you to stir our hearts and souls so that we would see the need of the those who are broken and ravaged by sin, but also, Lord, so that you would give us the words to say as we speak to win others to a saving faith in the Son of God. Now, our Father, as we call upon your name today, we do pray that your blessings would be upon us and that you would help us to labor with the utmost hope within our hearts. For we recognize that your word will not return unto you void. It will accomplish what you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereunto you send it. Help us to be faithful in scattering the good seed of the gospel every day that we live. And I pray, Lord, that you would water that seed through the blessing of the Holy Spirit and that you would win souls to the glory of your Son. Our Father and our God, be with the Hastings and all of those people to whom you have called them. We thank you, Lord, for the remarkable providence which you have revealed in calling many refugees from Islamic nations to the Atlanta area. Lord, truly you are a God who moves in mysterious ways, your wonders to perform. You plant your footsteps in the sea and you ride upon the storms. And so, our Father, we thank you that you are in the storms of life, that even in these storms that rage around us, you are guiding people to experience the glory of the Son of God and to hear the sweet overtures of salvation that we receive through him. Our Father and our God, be with the Hastings family. Give them words to speak that will indeed conquer hearts and lead others to faith in Christ. And as we pray for them, we would pray for ourselves also, that you would be with us, helping us to utilize every day as an opportunity to be used of God for the glory of your name. May it be so, for we ask all of these things in our Savior's holy and precious name. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to remain seated as we sing Holy, 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 hymn number 100, and we'll stand for the final stanza of this well-known hymn this morning.
Let's sing the doxology together. loving God and our Father, you are the fountain from which every good and perfect gift flows down into our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Father, we thank you for those very practical material possessions that you have also invested into our lives. Help us to use these as good stewards so that your name might be lifted very high and your grace might be experienced amongst our brothers and sisters in this house, but also so that we might reach the world for the glory of God. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Please remain standing as we read from the Word of God. The title of my sermon this morning is Hide and Seek. And we're going to find that Adam and Eve were playing the game of hide and seek with the living and the true God. So we'll take up our reading in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. We'll read the whole chapter, and as we conclude our reading, I'd like to jump over to Revelation chapter 6 and begin reading in verse 12. The reason for that is we will be tracing out the theme of hide and seek in the Word of God, and we find that people play the game hide and seek with God, not only at the dawn of creation, but all the way until the very conclusion of creation when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in glory. And so this will be an encouragement to all of us not to play hide-and-seek with the Lord. And we're going to see that the Lord's love is still available for those who are willing to acknowledge their sinfulness and their need of grace. And so my three points this morning will be the love of God endures, the love of God explores, and the love of God explains. And hopefully in seeing the love of God, you and I will lay aside any desire to play hide and seek and to pretend that God doesn't see the sinfulness of our lives and then to receive his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1, please remember that this is God's holy, inspired, life-giving word. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, 
I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam, for his wife, garments of skins, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, and knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Well, this text is all about Adam trying to hide from the piercing eyes of the all-knowing God, and we're going to read also that people will be doing that on the day of judgment. Revelation 6, beginning in verse 12, When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Let us pray together. Loving God, we do pray for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to be our portion. We know that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they must be spiritually discerned. We ask for that discernment which alone comes from the blessed third person of the Holy Trinity, the Spirit himself. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I wonder how many of you this morning can remember the last time that you played hide and seek. Now, as I ask you that question, I am assuming that you remember what hide and seek is all about. Playing hide and seek means that there is a person who is appointed to be the seeker, and they have to do their own due diligence to seek out and to find people who are doing everything in their power to hide and to remain camouflaged. So when is the last time that you played hide and seek? Well, the last time that I played hide and seek was up in Minnesota. It was a beautiful summer evening. My children were playing hide and seek along with me and along with their cousins and some of our family members who were there. And during that beautiful summer evening, I was crouching down behind a spruce tree. I thought that I would never be found, but somebody did see me, and I started to leap up to run so that I wouldn't be tagged. And as I leapt up, I felt something pop in my calf, and I did indeed pull a muscle 
game was over for Mr. Joe. But you know, there was a mo another time in my life when I was playing hide and seek to my own detriment. I was much younger at the time, probably around 16, back in the days when the crust of the earth was still cooling, of course, and I was playing during the twilight with a number of friends. And as I was running, I didn't see a steel cable coming down from a telephone pole, but I did see some Tweety birds and some stars as I clotheslined myself and fell to the ground in a lot of pain. In other words, what I'm revealing to you is there are times in our lives when playing hide-and-seek can be very detrimental, even dangerous, to our well-being. Now, we're going to see this theme in the passage which is before us this morning because we find that Adam and Eve, having sinned and becoming aware of their guilty conscience, do everything in their power not only to hide from God, but also to sow fig leaves together so that their shame and defilement and guilt would be hidden from his eyes. Now right off the bat then, brothers and sisters, we need to see the irrationality of sin. In other words, sin doesn't make sense. Why Adam and Eve, who had profound knowledge, thought that they could hide from the piercing, flaming eyes of a holy God is beyond me. But once again, sin is irrational. Sin is lunacy. And the Word of God assures us that the God that we worship is indeed a God who is present everywhere in the universe. Even as David said in Psalm 139, Lord, where shall we go from your presence? Where shall we flee from your spirit? If we ascend up into heaven, you are there. If we make our bed in hell, you are there. Even if we take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the earth, even there your hand will guide us, and your right hand will uphold us. God is everywhere present, which means God sees everything that you and I do, even the motives of our hearts. And so to think that you and I somehow can fashion loincloths to hide our guilt, sin, and shame from God is pure lunacy. And yet, beloved, I would remind you that although the human race is no longer sowing fig leaves together, nor hiding behind trees so that their sin, guilt, and shame would not be seen, the human race is doing the very same thing in essence that Adam and Eve are doing in this passage of God's Word. The scriptures are abundantly clear that every human being by nature does everything in his or her power to hide from the piercing eyes of God. One of the ways that they do this, of course, is by peers or by the influence of other human beings who are their family members and friends. The Apostle Paul assures us in Romans chapter 1, verse 32, that those who do such things, that is, rebellious things against God, those who do such things know the righteous judgment of God, but not only do these things, but have delight in those who do the very same things. And so one of the ways that the human race is trying to hide from the all-seeing eyes of our God is by joining their lives with the lives of other people who will assuage their conscience and make them feel better because, look, everyone is living in sin against God. Certainly, then, it couldn't be that dangerous or that detrimental to my soul. And so I believe that the human race believes that there is strength in numbers and there is peace in our peers as long as our friends are also living ungodly lives. And friends, I would remind each one of you this morning as a minister of the gospel, there will be millions and even billions of people in the lake of fire because they knit their heart together with people who were living in rebellion against God. And the Lord himself assures us that although hand in hand join together against the Lord, they will not go unpunished. In other words, people are sowing fig leaves today through the influence of their peers and ungodly friends. Don't follow in their footsteps. But not only are people hiding in our own generation from the influence of others, but they're also sowing fig leaves together through intoxication. 
In other words, they're not worshiping the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're worshiping an unholy trinity named Jose, Jack, and Adolf. What does that mean, Pastor? What are you trying to get at this morning by telling us that many people in the world are worshiping an unholy trinity, Jose, Jack, and Adolf? Have you ever heard of Jose Suervo? Have you ever heard of Jack Daniels? Have you ever heard of Adolf Coors? Well, I'm sure that you have. And one of the ways that people try to sew fig leaves together to hide their guilt and shame from God is by hiding not behind trees like Adam and Eve were doing in our passage, but hiding inside a bottle of Jack Daniels, or of Jose Suervo, or of Adolf Coors. We're told by the experts that about 6% of American citizens have extreme problems with alcohol. And medical practitioners are growing more alarmed because every single year, the amount of people who die from overdosing on drugs is rising. So that at this point, about 100,000 American citizens die from drug overdoses every year. And about 88,000 Americans die from alcohol-related deaths every single year. We might have more sophisticated fig leaves, but they're fig leaves nevertheless. And of course, we have not only influence of our peers and not only intoxication, but we also have the idols that are made with human hands. The way that some people hide from God is simply by devoting all of their energy unto the material possessions of this world. I remember many years ago, driving to minister the word of God to a congregation in Cleveland, Ohio. And as I was traveling along the highway on that beautiful spring summer morning, I noticed that the golf course was full and that the driveway of the golf course was packed. And so people weren't going to the house of God. They were pursuing their pleasures. They were worshiping a golf ball. Now, I have nothing against golf. I think it's a great sport. But unfortunately, people make a god of it, and they rather serve this god on Sunday morning than the god that you and I are worshiping even this very day. But there are all different types of fig leaves that people sow to hide their guilt and shame from the Almighty God. Unless you think that, well, this is only something that unbelievers do, and they certainly do do it, I would remind you this morning that there are times even among believers, even among the greatest believers, that you and I may follow in the footsteps of Adam and of Eve. You and I remember King David. He was one of the greatest men who ever walked the face of the planet. He was a very godly man who exalted the people of God even to the throne of heavenly glory in the book of Psalms. And yet this great man who was exalted unto heaven came plunging down to hell and he committed adultery. He even committed murder, you remember. And as you trace out his life after the time that he committed murder and adultery, you'll find that David lived, this great man, for about a year in a backslidden state without repenting of his evil, without turning on his heels and acknowledging his sin before the Most High God. So we all, believer and unbeliever, have a tendency of sowing fig leaves to hide our guilt and shame from the Lord. Now what I have to show you this morning is pretty simple. There is a rather austere bearing to everything that we're about to study this morning. But as we see so often in the Old Testament, that which comes to us with an austere bearing also brings the sweetness and the glory of the grace that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what I'm trying to help you to see this morning is that amidst the thunder and the lightning of the wrath of God against human sin, God remembers mercy. God presents grace. God offers every single one of us the hope that we need as broken, sinful, rebellious, hell-deserving people. And he invites us to receive forgiveness and eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, this is about the love of God 
this morning, which comes to Adam and Eve and all of their guilt, defilement, and shame. And the first thing that I'd like you to see is that the love of God endures. Here's a question for you. Have you ever said this to a person? I've had enough of you. Or, I've had it up to here with you. Or, enough is enough. Or, my patience is worn so thin with you, my fuse has burned down to the stick of dynamite, I am about to explode. I've had enough of you. Well, I would imagine most of us have at least thought that if we haven't actually said it with our words. But what we're seeing in the opening verse of our passage today is that God's ways are not our ways, nor are his thoughts our thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts, which means that when you and I say, I've had it up to here, I'm done with you. My fuse has burned down to the stick of dynamite. I'm about to explode. We find that God's love endures far beyond our finite ability to be patient with people. And this is a reason to praise God this morning, because if we know ourselves, every single one of us needs a lot of grace, and every one of us needs a tremendous amount of patience. And that's what we see in this passage. Pastor, how do we see the enduring love of God, even toward egregious sinners? Well, look at verse 8 with me, if you would. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, we read, And they heard the sound of the Lord God, notice this, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In the cool of the day means in the wind or in the breeze of the day. And what we're seeing is that the living and the true God who spoke the universe into being and established the foundations of the earth, this living and true God was in a habit of drawing near to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in the twilight at the time when the earth cooled. God would come to commune with those who he truly took delight in and truly loved with an abiding love. And the reason that we know that is because God is walking. They heard the sound of God walking. And some of the greatest commentators on this passage believe that the reason that they heard God walking was because God literally embodied his glory in a human form to hold fellowship with Adam and Eve in a way that Adam and Eve could understand and enjoy and appreciate. In other words, one of the greatest of the commentators on the book of Genesis is a commentator named Kyle, and another one whose name was Delich. And this is what they say, and they're very scholarly. The men have broken away from God, but God will not and cannot leave them alone. He comes to them as one man to another. This was the earliest form of divine revelation. God conversed with the first man in a visible shape, as the father and instructor of his children. He did not adopt this mode for the first time and after the fall, but employed it as far back as the period when he brought the beast to Adam and gave him the woman to be his wife. This human mode of intercourse between man and God is not a mere figure of speech, but a reality, having its foundation in the nature of humanity. In other words, God not only embodied his glory, in a human form before the fall. But even after the fall, God does the very same thing. And Adam and Eve, who were hiding behind the trees and weaving fig leaves together, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking to enter into fellowship with them. Now Adam and Eve were estranged. And Adam and Eve were receiving the repercussions, the consequences of their high treason against the Most High God. And we're about to see that this morning. But the simple point that I'd like you to see right at the beginning today is the fact that God did not say to Adam and Eve, the fountain of the human race, I've had it up to here with you. I am done with you. Or to teach you a New Jersey Italian expression today, it goes like this. Can anyone do that? 
That means I'm holding myself back because I am done, brother. I am done, sister. I've had it up to here. What we see is that the love, the kindness, the compassion of our God endures even over human sin so that where sin avails, grace does much more avail as the Apostle Paul teaches us in the Word of God. And so, brothers and sisters, what we have is the enduring love of God, the very call that called us to worship today from Psalm 136 has this reality 26 times in it, almost as if God is taking the nail of his enduring love and he's hammering it into our minds. He's hammering it into our consciousness because you and I have such a hard time believing when we feel that our conscience is lacerated we have a hard time believing that the love of God is still available for us. And so the Lord inspired a man like David to assure us that the steadfast love of God endures forever. And he did so 26 times in that beautiful psalm. So brothers and sisters, you might scan the history of your life and you might be embarrassed, even ashamed, at certain things that you have done. Not only did they harm you, but they harmed people that you care about. And you truly are ashamed to such an extent that you want to run and hide behind a tree. You want to enter into a bottle. You want to take barbiturates to hide your guilt and shame. But God knows all about it. And the very God who drew near to Adam and Eve still desires to draw near in love and communion everyone who receives him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 8. Lord, when I consider the moon and the stars that you have ordained, the work of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? God is willing to visit you and to pour out his love upon you and to commune with you and to cleanse you from all of your guilt and all of your shame, but you have to stop running to a bottle or running to ungodly peers or running to the idols of your own making in this world because ultimately all of these fig leaves and all of these trees will prove insignificant to hide you from the all-seeing eyes of a holy God. The love of God endures. Now this is important for us to know. And at times when you and I think about the enduring love of God, we do so in contrast to human love which does not endure. Have you ever sang the beautiful hymn, O Love, that will not let me go? Well, that hymn was written on the 6th of June in the year 1882 by a Scottish minister of the gospel whose name was George Matheson. And he said that something remarkable happened to him that he can't explain during the five minutes that it took him to write that beautiful hymn, O oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go. It's almost as if the words trickled out of his mouth and spilled out of his pen. But he was going through a time of severe mental anguish. You see, George Matheson was blind. He wasn't blind from birth. In fact, he could see for many years, but he started to go blind when he was about 20 years old. And when he started to go blind, he was engaged to be married to the woman that he loved. And recognizing that he's going to have to tell his beloved that he's going blind, he did indeed stir up the courage to tell her. And after he told her that he's going blind, she broke off the engagement. She wanted to have nothing to do because she said, I cannot stand the thought of living the rest of my life with a blind man. She broke his heart. She shattered his soul. And it's a part of that difficulty that he went through that helped him to write that beautiful hymn, O oh love that will not let me go. Human love may let me go and turn its back on me. But there is a God who will never let me go this side of heaven and who will never turn his back upon me. And so he started to live with his sister who had eyes she could see. And so his loving sister who was unmarried started to learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew to help her brother George because he was a minister of the gospel and he wanted to study the original languages. 
And so he was thankful to God for the faithful love of his unmarried sister for many years. But the time came when George Matheson's sister became engaged, and the day came where she was married. And so George, this faithful Scottish minister, was all by himself, alone in the world again. And it was on the night of his sister's marriage, the historians believe, that he wrote the words to that beautiful hymn, O love that will not let me go. Brothers and sisters, do you hear those words echoing beautifully, hauntingly from this text to your soul today? in your guilt, in your shame, as God embodies his glory and draws near to Adam and Eve who are doing everything in their power to hide from him. The love of God endures, but the love of God, secondly, explores. Notice the first question that we have in the inspired writings. It's an echo of what you and I should hear even this very day. God asks Adam and Eve, where are you? I believe that this is one of the most important, if not the most important question that you could ever ask to your own soul. Where are you? We're not speaking here about physical location. We're speaking about something deep and profound. Where are you in the depths of your soul? And the answer that Adam and Eve could have given is, we are loveless and we are lost. We are now alienated. We are now estranged from the God who has revealed such great love to us. For we have tried to topple him from his throne, and we have arrogantly defied the wisdom that he offers unto us. We have followed the evil one instead of following the righteous God who has proven his love for us. We are lost. And I would remind you this morning that there are eternal consequences to what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. God said, in the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And death in the word of God is a very rich, pregnant, robust reality. Adam and Eve did become mortal in the day that they ate of their fruit. Physical death started to work in their human bodies. But as soon as they ate of that fruit, they saw that they were naked, which means that they were exposed to the wrath of God. And so they became spiritually dead, unable to save themselves, to do anything to affect their own salvation and liberation from the repercussions of sin. And of course, this death that God threatened means not only physical death and spiritual death, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the most loving human being who has ever walked the earth, assures us that the death that is upon every one of us by nature is an eternal death. There is a place of weeping and of wailing and of gnashing of teeth, and it is eternal in its duration. And once you go to the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, you will mourn, you will languish without any hope throughout all eternity. The question is, where are you? Are you in Christ today? Or are you outside of Christ today? Are you going your own way, living your own life, following in the example of Adam and Eve? Or are you kneeling before the cross? Are you confessing your sin and crime against God? And are you receiving the assurance of his love and grace, which is given to those who walk humbly before him? Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, the Lord Jesus Christ said. But the question that provokes our thoughts and hopefully causes us to wake up spiritually is this. Where are you, spiritually speaking? You might be an unbeliever, and that means that you are totally lost. You might be a believer who is living in a backslidden state like King David did centuries and centuries ago. 
Let me give an example that happened here in California, which hopefully will elucidate what we're trying to study today. On the 26th of September last year, an Iranian-American was sailing his sailboat for the first time off the coast of Marina del Rey, so to our north, up around LA. He had three friends who were sailing with him. And he noticed that there were some beautiful dolphins that were going in front of his sailboat, and they kept going in a particular direction. And he would keep going, they would keep going, only to return, and the dolphins would continue to go before this man's sailboat and continue to go in the direction that they went in before. And this happened a multitude of times. And so this man started to think to himself, these dolphins are trying to tell me something. So the man said, okay, he's going to follow the dolphins. This is a true story, folks. So he did. Three miles off the coast of Marina del Rey, California, this man saw a human hand lunging out of the water. And he did a double take because he couldn't believe what he was seeing. And so he sailed over to this human hand. And when he looked down, he noticed that there was a naked woman in the water who was so tired that she had no energy to continue to tread the water. And the war, water, of course, was very cold. This is the Pacific. This is not the Atlantic. And so the man threw a life raft. She was too weak to grab it. They threw her a rope, and somehow she was able to grab the rope. And this individual, along with his friends, pulled this woman onto the sailboat. She was naked. She said that she was skinny dipping around 12 o'clock off of Venice Beach the night before. She was caught in a riptide, and she was sucked out three miles into the ocean. And the Coast Guard still doesn't know how a woman could last in these chilly waters for that long, but she did last. And we know that it was God's providence to lead this individual so that he would find this woman who desperately needed to be rescued. If you were to ask that woman, where are you? She could answer, I'm lost, I'm naked, I'm ashamed, I played the fool, I was sucked out in the riptide of my own foolishness, and I was right on the brink of destruction. That's where every one of us is by nature. We have all been sucked out in the riptide, and we're miles and miles from the shore of safety. And so what we're learning this morning is that the love of God not only indoors, but the love of God explores. And the way that the love of God explores the human conscience today is by asking the very same question, where are you? And God begins to stir our conscience with his own law, the Ten Commandments, the Holy Decalogue. And we believe, according to Romans 3, verse 19, that the law was given with a gracious intent so that every mouth might be stopped and all the world might see their guilt before the Most High God. You see, God is still asking every one of us, where are you? And as he does so, his love endures, his love explores, and his love, thirdly, explains. His love explains what we're going through in this world. You'll notice this in our passage of Holy Scripture this morning in verse 14 of chapter 3, when God pronounces the curse upon the serpent. He says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. And he goes on in verse 15 to say, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. This is a curse, folks. To the devil. And at the very time, he's thundering against the work of the lubricious serpent. He gives us the first announcement of salvation through the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. This seed of the woman born of supernatural birth, this seed of the woman is going to crush your head at the very time that you are striking his heel. He goes on to the woman next. 
And he said, in pain, you are going to give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And we know that the woman's desire for her husband means to rule over her husband, which is against God's created order. Wives have been called to be submissive to their husband. But God said to Eve the very thing that he went on to say to Cain in the next chapter. The sin that's crouching at your door, its desire is for you. It wants to master you. It wants to rule over you. And ladies, you're going to find that same desire to do the very same thing to your husband. And it's going to cause estrangement and alienation in your relationship. This is a part of the fall. So God, through speech, is explaining the confused world, the mess that we have made. And he goes on to man, of course, in verses 17 to 19, and he speaks here about thorns and thistles. Through the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat your bread. Life is going to be much harder. You're no longer in this pristine paradise anymore. But you see, God enables us to understand why the world is in the shambles that it's in. I don't recommend this song at all. But there is a singer named Bon Jovi from the Garden State. And he sings a song entitled, What the H-E-L-L is Going On. And it's a blasphemous song. And in this song, he's pointing his finger at God that he freely rejects. He's a complete liberal. And he blasphemy cries out to God, what the H-L-L is going on. Well, there are many people who blasphemy, ask the same question. But God is telling us what's going on. You want to know why the world is messed up? Christians have the answer. It's because we want to be God instead of allowing God to be God. And when we do that, no matter how smart we might think we are, we are going to lead to ruination and damnation. You see, God explains through speech. God explains through symbol. Verse 21, God came to Adam and Eve with the skins of animals to cover Adam and Eve. And the word cover in the Hebrew means atonement, to hide your guilt and your shame. And God is saying, look, your flimsy fig leaves, they're not going to get the job done. You need something not from man, but from God. And those sacrificial animals from which the skins were taken. They were a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who clothes us in his perfect life and who clothes us in his atoning death. He died so that our guilt might be purged, so that the wrath of God might be extinguished. God is saying, you have a problem, I can help you with that problem, and I love you enough to clothe you in the righteousness of my Son. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. But quickly, notice that the Lord explains not only through speech and through symbol, but the Lord explains through separation. Verse 24, he drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim, guardian angelic beings, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is gracious. If Adam and Eve ate from the tree of life, they would have been confirmed in their fallen condition. But God is placing a flaming sword held by cherubim so that Adam and Eve, who are now expelled from the garden, excommunicated from this paradise, they could not come and be confirmed in their fallen state. But excommunication was a reality from paradise. And what we learn from Revelation 6, and this is why I wanted you to hear that this morning, is that the human race is playing hide and seek. Lunacy. Irrationality. They think they can hide from God, and they're going to be playing this game all the way up until the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of glory with 10,000 times 10,000 of his saints and angels 
and even the greatest of all men and the kings of the earth and the rich men and the slave and the free and the Greek and the Roman and the barbarian, it doesn't matter what skin color you are or how much money you have in your bank account, every human being who has been playing hide and seek refusing to acknowledge their need for Christ will be calling for the mountains and the hills and the rocks to hide them from the great wrath of the Lamb for the day of His wrath has come will be able to stand. Only those who have stopped hiding behind the trees, only those who have stopped worshiping Jose Suervo, Adolf Coors, Jack Daniels, or any other false god that you can look to. God is saying, I still love you. I'm still here for you. I still desire to commune with you throughout all eternity. Come to me. Embrace me. Receive the gospel. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be clothed with beautiful garments. And you will be loved forever and ever. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us. Loving Father, how we thank you for the privilege of studying your holy word today. Help us, Lord, to receive fully and freely the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his saving glory, for we pray in his name. Amen. Let's uh, close by singing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, number 254. bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.